We're very excited to be with you today. Um, this panel is going to open up a bit of conversation, perhaps that we haven't focused on quite as much yet in our time together, um, that of the role of biotechnology and innovation for the agriculture and forestry sector. And I'm delighted to have on this panel some, some uh, amazing people who have done a vast number of things throughout the entire field of agriculture, forestry, and the creation of food, feed, fiber, and fuel for a growing planet. So before we start, though, with, with the members of the panel, I do want to take a really quick survey of the room. I'm going to ask you to raise your hands if, and then keep, them, keep your hands up as I go through a series of questions. First of all, raise your hands, please, if your grandparents raised food and worked and lived on a farm. OK, 90% of the audience. Keep your hands up if your parents worked on the farm. OK, considerably fewer. Keep your hands up if you personally work on a farm. I forgot to ask our panelists to do the same. <laughs> we do have an actual farmer on our panel today. So um, this is a, um, an example of what I would call uh, the, the productivity and sustainability of agriculture revolution. So today, with nearly 7.3 billion people on the planet, we have fewer people, at least in the developed countries, than ever before working in agriculture. In the US, it's about 1% of our population. Slightly higher, perhaps, for the EU. I don't know what the percentage might be, but probably between 2 and 5%. But for many countries in the developing world, it used to be about 90%. Now it's, it's dropping, but it's still between 60 and 70% in many countries. So this is um, evidence of what we would call a productivity revolution. And when I talk about productivity, as many of you realize, it's not just about food production, but it's about essentially the efficiency of agriculture and forestry. So we're producing a lot more now with less. And uh, we actually measure that in a ratio called total factor productivity, or TFP. And my organization works uh, deeply on these issues of productive, sustainable agriculture. And I brought along some materials with me later. We can talk about these, and I have flash drives and, and reports to share later. Um, but this productivity revolution is a bit about what we're going to, to discuss today, some of the innovations that have enhanced this productivity revolution, and some challenges that we see going forward. So I'm going to ask our panelists now um, to perhaps just share a bit about their pathway into their current careers and to talk a bit about what each of their companies or what, what their organizations do. I'm going to start at the far end with our farmer expert, Sir Peter Kendall. If you say a few words, and then we'll, we'll come back this way. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Margaret. Really appreciate the chance to be here. And it's a very peculiar setting for me. I live 15 miles away from here. I uh, woke up this morning, and I was sorting out uh, a biomass heating system for my poultry farm. Um, but I'm primarily a cereal farmer as well, so I've come straight from the farm. A bit of my background, as Margaret said, that my pathway to uh, even being invited to be here today. Um, I went to Nottingham University, um, not quite as, as eminent as, as, as Cambridge, um, and I was doing agricultural economics, but with friends who went on to do so many other things. No, no one else was interested in agriculture. And they all thought I was crazy, so I sort of developed a, 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 a style of championing um, why farming was important. And then we had a couple of incidents in the UK that really turned society, I think, and government away from domestic agriculture. We had the outbreak of BSE, where we had mad cow disease. We had mm. massive slaughtering um, of, of animals, the, the concern that meat was dangerous. And then in 2001, we had an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which had posters up saying countryside closed. Mm. Both of those incidents cost the country about 9 billion, 9 or 10 billion each time. And we got to a point when, in the early 2000s, where the government came to the view, or there was a perceived view, that the smaller the agricultural sector was in the UK, the less risk it was to the environment and to the economy. And you know, I was, at that stage in my um, early 40s, starting to use my sort of skills to being champion to go out and sort of say, we need to reverse this. And lo and behold, I found myself in 2004, being president of the National Farmers Union, hmm. um, which is the biggest organization in the UK. And again, on, on the view of saying how important it was to have a domestic industry. 
um, I started pointing out that the world had produced less food than it had been consuming for six out of the previous seven years. What was happening to global population, the middle class, all the big issues we've just been alerting to, and why we needed a strong domestic agriculture. Um, we had a food price spike in 2008, 2010, 2012. We saw grain prices double around the world. And the UK appointed a new chief scientist in 2008 called Sir John Bennington. Um, he did a foresight report on the future of food and farming, which just said how important it was, the big challenges, why we needed to think smartly about producing food. Um, so um, I did eight years doing that job, and I now chair the Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board, which is about how we drive the productivity on farm. But I am, um, and I say to Margaret earlier on, I'm, I'm an angry person. I'm going to give you two reasons for being angry. One is because I led the farmers to remain in the European Union, because actually I think we need to collaborate to solve these challenges. We need to work together. Um, and the second thing I'm going to make you, hopefully make you chuckle about is my son has been given an offer to go to Oxford University, not come to Cambridge. Um, but when he got his offer through, he still would have passed his exams, and I was taking him back to school last night. And his teacher turned to me, he said, I'm so glad he's got an offer to Oxford. He said he's far too bright to be a farmer. Hmm. Christ, that makes you cross. <laughs> that makes me absolutely furious. We need the brightest brains we can possibly get, whether they're doing the professor's job, whether they're actually doing the practitioners out on farms, this is the challenge of our time, and we need the best brains to address it. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Professor Montague. Well, uh, the story, I think, it has been written in annual reviews uh, of biotechnology. And, uh, it's a long way to the GMO. So uh, I come from a city in Belgium, Ghent, working class world, where nobody had done high school, uh, only primary school. Uh, since it, it happened that uh, I was uh, rather good, uh, I could always convince to go further. And already in high school, I, I knew I would do organic chemistry, so because well, we were those just after the war and in the late 40s. <coughs> uh, started in 51 in chemistry and then realized I wanted to do biochemistry. And in, in that period, just the real breakthroughs came came around, around DNA, RNA. So we went with some friends in Walter Fears and uh, Jeff Shell uh, started to be interested in this new thing that called molecular biology. And so we were the, the world of the phages and microbiology, the late, in the late 60s, we thought, well, uh, higher eukaryotes, that's really the important of the world. Walter Fierce went in cancer research, and, uh, and uh, Jeb and I took up how agrobacterium infects plants and what's going on. And that's the story. Uh, I always stayed at the university, but uh, luckily, our Minister of Education said that at the university, uh, you never should make products. Uh, uh, we even cannot take patents here at the state university. Uh, so then, OK, we, we, there were the startups that we had seen that the United States was already doing in the 70s. Uh, uh, and we were lucky. The, uh, people always ask why these three uh, things, the BT, the herbicide resistant, and hybrid vigor, you did three things, and all three were the big successes, and it's the only thing that is done uh, till now in, uh, in uh, plant biotechnology. Well, it's because indeed they were good, so at that moment, all what you do was, would have been good. It was nothing bright, especially in, the, mm -hmm. uh, in what we did. And the big companies, the agrochemical companies, took it up, and as agrochemical companies, they want to be the first and, and to win. So what do you have to do in economy? Make that you have a mono monopoly. So uh, they worked for a monopoly. They are not the machines of society. Uh, and society said, oh, uh, what is that? What is that? And, but they shielded off. And these three things is the only one that's available now. So society has to organize that really uh, it can be done 
for the rest of the world where mm. it is badly needed. In mm. the first place, Africa, we have seen yesterday the population curves that are expected for Africa. It's very urgent, but I think for all over the world and for all farmers, uh, even for the vegetables that you have, if you have, would have double or triple yield and if you have better quality, it would be important. Mm. And surely for the environment, it would be important. Yeah, exactly. Mike. Well, thank you. And it, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning. Um, my, uh, I started uh, 30 years ago this year, uh, graduating from University of Warwick, which uh, is probably even smaller than University of Nottingham. But, uh, <laughs> um, and that was a PhD in, in design of anti-cancer drug using plant toxins. And um, it was a long way away from what I was really interested in. Um, it was going right into medical field and, and my, my own passion is about nature and um, so I, I've always wanted to find a way of linking my work to, to what really drives me um, and I've always been aware that um, you know, agriculture is a, part, a big part of the landscape and you, that you need this balance between nature and man and there's that always this, this conflict there and you don't need a conflict, you can actually mm. um, yeah. try to work towards sharing the landscape with nature or, or sparing parts of it for nature, whichever part you want. You, you, there's ways of doing it, and mm -hmm. I actually think British agriculture has done a good job for that. Mm. But so I, I, I took my career into, into agriculture, and in those days, 30 years ago, um, molecular biology, as Mark said, was starting up. And, uh, I, I joined a company in France, uh, in those days called Rumpolenc, nowadays called Aventis, um, <coughs> and joined their nascent laboratoire de biologie moléculaire et cellulaire et végétale, and, and we, we looked at trying to apply all of this wonderful new technology to mm. um, disease resistance and, and all sorts of things in, in their core crops. Um, we were always overshadowed by this factory in the University of Ghent that was churning out <laughs> publications and the famous Mark van Montague and you know, this, this great shadow that the rest of the community li lived under. And uh, I, I left Rumpelenk and went to the University of Oxford where a, a former professor from Edinburgh was setting up the Department of Plant Sciences and he says, oh, well, you need, we need new people, we need new brains. And, so he invited me to go along and set up a group. And, and still there was this shadow of Ghent looming <laughs> over Oxford. And in the end, I said, well, you know, the competition is too big. I'll, I'll go and join them. So I, I <laughs> applied for a grant and I joined Mark's lab. Excellent. Um, but al always there was this idea, and, and Mark, I think, uh, made me very conscious of this. That, that, and as he said in his speech, that the, there's this application gap. You know, you've, you, you can look into a test tube all you like, but you're not going to, you're not going to feed people in, in the developing world. Um, so when, a, when the offer of joining one of his companies, Plant Genetic Systems, came up to, to learn technology transfer, I grabbed that and had a great time transferring technology and, and wonderful. Um, and then that, that company was acquired and, and there was a, a big merger and it became much bigger and German and um, I, I left and uh, went to India, and uh, I helped mm. set up three companies while I was there, biotech startups. Um, I'd always had this entrepreneurial feeling, and, um, and, mm. and today I'm in another startup, um, Futurogene, which is a spin-off from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, um, and our focus is on uh, raising the productivity of trees. Mm. Um, we were acquired uh, in 2010 by um, uh, Susano, which is uh, one of the largest pulp and paper companies in the world in Brazil. Um, and we're applying biotechnology for raising the yield of eucalyptus in Brazil. Uh, and we see that as very much as, as part of the, the whole sustainability issue. If you can produce more with less, mm. uh, you can hopefully mm. spare land for biodiversity. So mm -hmm. my, my career has come full circle and, and finally to be in public affairs again. Um, very often the problems are not technical problems, they're not financial problems, they're political problems. So 
my early career of trying to change the world by sitting in a lab, uh, it doesn't work. You have to be out there like you, fighting the political battle and getting the story across that science and technology is part of the solution. It's not mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. And helping politicians hopefully one day understand that. Mm -hmm. Great, but great, great to have a variety of experiences from, from the lab, from the farm, from the field, the forest, uh, back to these things, the kind of circular nature of being an effective leader is to have a number of experiences as broad as, as you can, uh, and also to go deep. So getting a mixture of these experiences. For me, it was um, a bit personal. My father grew up on a farm in Kentucky, growing tobacco, dairy, hogs, you know, kind of a mixed, mixed farm, small farm. Um, he grew up actually plowing behind a mule, um, which to me, Today is unfathomable in the United States or a developed country, but this was his, his experience growing up. Um, went away, uh, he, he left the farm, but a few years later they finally got a tractor. Um, but, but to see the progression in the United States over time, but, and always to keep in the back of my mind, how can farmers have access to better technology? Uh, why should they be kept poor? <laughs> we need farmers all over the world uh, at ed every scale to be productive, sustainable, and to contribute to this mission of helping feed the world. We're going to have 10 billion people by 2050. Um, are we going to have a lot of new land to use? No. I mean, we're actually hitting peak land right now. There's probably some land in sub-Saharan Africa that we could carefully open up. But to avoid opening land and releasing more carbon, what would be helpful is to have a productive, sustainable system. And uh, agriculture really needs investments in technology, innovation, embracing these technologies and tailoring them for farmers of all scales everywhere. We've got about 500 million farmers that are small scale across the world, chiefly in, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, who lack a lot of the basic technologies that we take for granted here. Um, I would like to turn a bit now in our discussion um, to think about what are, are some of the other challenges that you see in each of your sectors, just, just a line or two, uh, perhaps from, from the forestry side, uh, from crops perhaps in Africa, and perhaps in the developed markets. What are a couple of key challenges that you see in your work? Who starts? <laughs> you. Let's Me. start with the forest. <coughs> uh, the, the key challenge is resource use efficiency. Um, we talk about population growth as being the major challenge. There's another challenge, and that's um, depletion of natural resources. And um, one, one marker for that that I like quite a lot is, is Earth Overshoot Day. Um, Earth Overshoot Day is basically the, the, uh, the Earth's capacity to regenerate or to provide natural resources uh, divided by the ecological footprint of humanity, how much we use and how much CO2 we give out, times 365. In 1987, that was 19th of December. In other words, in that year, we were using one planet worth of resources. We were, at, we were at the carrying capacity of the planet. This year, it's going to be July 27, which means we're using 1.7 planets worth of natural resources in a year. And if you add on to that population growth, then we're in for a big problem. Mm. So, so we, we need a new trajectory. Um, and, and, and you must experience this as well, that you can have these discussions inside the UN, and oh, we've got the Sustainable Development Goals, and we, we're going to talk about uh, how to make agriculture more sustainable, how we're going to reduce emissions. You basically need to kickstart a new trajectory within the next few years if we're actually going to get down to one planet's worth of natural resources by 2050, which means that you're going to have to have a massive application of science and technology to actually bring agriculture and forestry onto that level uh, and, and all around the world all at once. So, and we're, we're nowhere near having that discussion today. Mm -hmm. So we need to, I, I think the big challenge for the audience here, uh, you know, you're the people who are going to actually go to the UN and actually tell them. We, we, we need to change the way from talking to doing. Mm. Um, and actually, you know, the, the scientific solutions are there, the finances are there. I mean, Bloomberg and Ceres did a, did a study of 
of what it would cost to actually make the world energy efficient. And it, it's within our means, the money's there. We just have to redistribute it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's purely this political question of, well, we... Question of political will. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. A key challenge in Africa, perhaps, that you're, you're well, seeing. Well, in Africa, it's so urgent to do capacity building. People, wherever you go, are eager to participate. They want to do it, but uh, Europe blocks it because saying, oh, this biotechnology, uh, that's not for Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what, what else do they do as solutions? So we are able, uh, we know we are making the, uh, able to, with the knowledge there is already to, uh, to make a, uh, these improvements. So how to do it? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's the political will, but also uh, convince the, our scientists who also uh, want to help and who realize that we need to have the products there. So if, if there is some new products uh, that the farmers see uh, and, and, and understand, and, and, they immediately will want to grow it. We have seen some examples with the BT cotton and others. Mm -hmm. We will not go about the details uh, uh, from what has been advanced to them. They must be able to make it them themselves. Yes. So we uh, discussing with some people to make something like uh, postdocs without borders. Postdocs who are interested mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to use their knowledge to bring uh, either uh, renewal in education or renewal in startups in the mm -hmm. country that make a product mm -hmm. uh, and uh, use the CRISPR-Cas technology or, or GM or whatever, but use the best availability of science in a network of uh, people who uh, bring them uh, the, the materials so that they can do the innovations there and, mm -hmm. uh, and see how that uh, will work out and see how in the there are organizations like the CGR who have the labs and who have people with vision and particularly who have the traditional knowledge on what is going on in the field because molecular biologists don't know that so uh, these postdocs without border should talk to the people who know how you do intercropping what is the often crops that these people can grow there and how can you increase the yield? Mm -hmm. uh, it's so evident from all what we know in biology that, that with uh, some minor steps, you already, with the knowledge we have at the moment, mm -hmm. and don't think about what, what's coming uh, with all the genome sequences and see that it works. Yeah, the problem, um, some of the research that we've done is showing that by 2030, Sub-Saharan Africa will only be able to meet about 8% of its food demand by 2030 through productivity. So um, they're probably going to be able to make most of that demand, but it's going to be through opening up new land. It could be through importing food. But the food demand that's coming in Africa is going to be massive. And how will they do it? How will they meet their food demand? How will they meet their fiber, feed, fuel demands? Um, it's, it's not going to be through a sustainable, productive model. Unless we make the the uh, innovations and, and uh, training and the capacity building now, right? How about you? What are I, you saying? I did, um, Margaret, I did for a moment, it's a side, side track and I'll come to the challenge. Mm -hmm. I did for my sins for, for a couple of months or uh, about nearly a year, I was president of the World Farmers Organization and thinking about the challenges of Africa and there was a number of individuals who, who were wrapped up in, in these big global organizations and I was so frustrated because I would sit at a meeting in Rome, and people would pull in in their big stretch limos, and they would talk about the, the, the benefits of subsistence agriculture. Mm. And I'd try and explain to them as a clue in the title. And when an incredibly, you know, obviously affluent um, African gentleman came to me and he was talking about the fantastic um, success of subsistence agriculture, and I said, well, doesn't your son go to an American university? Is that what you've got in mind for him? And your reference to your father plowing behind uh, an oxen, you know, my, where I live, uh, the, the guy who actually still lives on the farm, he's 88, so the first job he did was plow with a horse behind my house. He said it was, I can't use the right language he'd use, but it was <laughs> not great work. Um, it's freezing cold, the animal kicks you, 
you're out there doing a little bit for hours and hours and hours. He now looks at my tractors that steer themselves, that can link up to the phones, they can communicate. Yeah. It's mapping the work, it's keeping a record of the compaction. The yeah. technology we're applying is making a massive difference. We don't know yet quite how to use all the information yeah. we're gathering. But he eyes with envy. I've got Prince Charles who in the UK, and we get myself into trouble, I hope this doesn't go out too widely. He goes out and he, he'll be seen in his um, traditional, he's got an old rough coach and he goes laying a few um, bricks on a dry stone wall. Well, it's great if you do it for an hour when the cameras are there. <laughs> when it's November and December and January and it's really horrible, um, that's not great work. Um, and we've got to think about how we make this exciting, work enjoyable, because for me in the UK, there's a number of big issues. One is productivity, um, about the fact that we in the UK, for a number of reasons, we've pulled out of investment. Um, the acceptance that science got a big role to play in farming. I look at what's happening in, in the Netherlands. They're growing their productivity from 2000 to 2013. Grew at 3.5% in the US, 3.2%. Ours growing at 09 hmm. And today I've got a, a government that I think is trying to repair the, the, the damage of Brexit by appealing to your generation. Um, he thinks that the, the younger generation are... Uh, only focused on the environment and by challenging, and there's been a BBC programme called The Blue Planet. I'm getting Conservative MPs are putting out messages. How are we going to save the planet? They're not linking it to technology. They're not linking to the science we can use to do it. Even in my days at the NFU, 12 years ago, I had a slogan about producing more, impacting less. Mm -hmm. And how we do that will be through smart agriculture, and it's not turning our back on it. And there are too many politicians, I'll come to my final point, who think this is either or. And we need your generation, who I see my kids, everything they do now is linked in some way digitally. We need the, this, not, previous speakers said we need political change. I think that comes by the younger generation mm -hmm. accepting that we use digital solutions to be smart agriculturalists. Thank you. Excellent. So yeah, the, the future of farming, future of agriculture, helping farmers of all scales, no matter where they are, move up that productivity ladder. It's going to look different if you're a smallholder farmer in uh, Senegal than it is if you're a, a rancher in Colombia, then UK farmer. But the goal is that productive, sustainable agriculture. So what are some of the exciting changes you're seeing coming? What's the what are the game-changing innovations that you think are, are novel in the agritech sector specifically that you think have a, a great potential in the next five to 10 years? So um, starting at this end, coming back. So my comment about subsistence farming earlier on is actually I want people to have the same exciting, high quality way of life that we all have. Mm. So, when sure. you, so, it so it's how do we get people to have those exciting lives? Mm. Um, the the, the, the game-changers for me, and. Uh, I'm almost assuming now for, um, that we're not going to have some of the really smart plant breeding technologies available to us here in the UK. Hmm. Um, but I've, again, going back to my farm, we, we've been doing some drainage work. The weather in the UK has been horrible um, the last six months. And I've been letting water off. I've been looking at old drainage maps. And we did, probably 40 years ago, enlarge some fields. We changed some shapes, going back to the the, the ploughing by with horses, you'd know exactly where the soil type changed. Then we enlarged fields, we've got bigger sprayers, bigger machines, and we've lost some of that detail and precision understanding that we used to have with horses. Hmm. What I think we'll be able to do, I think we're almost there now, but we're not learning how to implement it, is we'll be able to look after a square metre of land with a precision we used to look after whole fields. Hmm. And that will be through drones, precision identification of weeds, stress, monitoring, maybe from some drones, maybe some from satellite as well. And we'll be treating small parts of fields very specifically. Mm. And that, I think, helps us in the UK get over some of that technological barrier. Mm. But I want to provide that provision, precision to individuals. I was in um, the Netherlands on, on Friday on a almost completely automated dairy farm. Um, and these cows were going into milking cubicles, but they were also being fed. But the smart thing was they were, their health 
was being measured. I had a, a, a medical checkup yesterday. These animals were being checked every single day. They were being checked with mats where they walked on mm. and they could tell whether there was pressure different mm. for different feet because they could predict that it might be going lame in two days' time. Mm. Farmer said to me, he said, I used to sit, and this is probably getting unsavory now, he'd sit in the cow shed at night to see if the cows were coming into heat, ready for mating. Now, when they go to be fed, automatically tells them. Yeah. You know, the technological advances we can make now are only just starting to scrape the surface. Yep. Animal health, key. And maybe some crossover with the, the personal biomedicine, all of these types of things, the crossover is, is fascinating. How about you? Key innovation coming. Well, CRISPR. For, uh, is CRISPR it? Yeah, well, <laughs> part of it. But uh, indeed, uh, this kind of uh, precision agriculture for the rich world, uh, it's impossible at the moment to do it uh, in, in developing countries uh, because for the subsistence farmers. Uh, but uh, there are so many breakthroughs in plant science also uh, that can be used and that nobody knows about it. Uh, potatoes are still grown uh, by uh, cuttings and, and planting potatoes. How can you good, make good varieties uh, uh, for the highlands in, uh, in Burundi, Rwanda, the, 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 the thousand uh, hills there? Uh, it's an enormous transport. Well, uh, people have made seed potatoes now, uh, and you can do breeding, and potatoes can, be, can be, uh, become very important in developing countries. If you, in this area, suddenly, uh, you, you, a bag of seeds is equivalent to uh, uh, three tons of potatoes that you, uh, that you yeah. may know. And, but that can be done for so many other crops that typically grow in an area uh, to bring some progress through molecular biology if you would have the right net network. How about nutrition? Uh, so a lot of the, work, the food we're producing sometimes has lost some quality and, and nutritional value. What, what, what can be done to improve the nutrition? It's fascinating that even the, the data are not known well enough the, uh, for the systematically breeding that farmers do. And if you see the amount of iron and magnesium uh, that's present in, in some grains 20 years ago, 10 years ago, uh, five years ago, it completely goes down because the way breeding is done and nobody pays attention uh, uh, to the quality of it. And through some little engineer, uh, also some coating of seeds or uh, and, and a wise use of, of fertilizers and other composition, you could change it, but nobody follows it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, micronutrients that are missing or vitamins that are missing or give dramatic effects even on among the poor people here because they have bad food. The poor people will always eat the same and, and have no variety. Uh, they they are, have also the stunted children that like you see in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. and, There's uh, some good work though being done with be done. biofortification, right? Yeah. yeah. Some, some to improve. No, well, we, in, yeah. Recently in uh, in, in Ghent, we did the uh, folate. Everybody knows that pregnant women uh, have a danger of spina bifida with uh, uh, shortage of folates. We have made rice, we are making potatoes and others that have uh, the necessary uh, amount of folate. So that, that is a possibility, but mm. th that's just uh, one aspect. Uh, all this th type of science, uh, uh, really uh, quality of, of food, nutrition science, uh, in general, uh, in, in medicine is only coming up, but there is not too much knowledge that, uh, that is there. It's Again, a wide open field. Because uh -huh. a lot of the feeding is not only the quality of the food, but also the microorganisms that are in the gut that are, or that are in our skin. Exactly. And, and, or, we, 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 it's science that, that, that's in uh, full development. So we use it for our health, we have to use it for the planet health and, uh, and uh, the organisms that are needed to make a fertile soil and the organisms that make that we have good crop yield. And Michael, how about you, forestry? <coughs> All right, <coughs> I, I think these are really exciting times for forestry fiber, um, fiber production. And I think, <coughs> I think a lot of the technological breakthroughs for increasing productivity or controlling pest diseases, that can be done through 
molecular biology, whatever, CRISPR-Cas, GMOs, and, and put that into the breeding cycle of the trees, and we can have, we know we can produce faster growing trees, uh, disease resistant trees, that's fine. I, th I think the real technological breakthrough, though, is in, is in 3D printing, tissue printing, hmm. and the revolution that's going to bring to making these chairs we sit on, the tables we sit on, the buildings that surround us. You can now, you can now make a multi-story building out of wood. Hmm. And if you think about the implications of that, um, you know, displacing the traditional building materials, cement, and if you think about the, the sustainability of those buildings, we talk a lot about sustainable cities, sustainable lifestyles. Have buildings made out of wood. That's carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. You're growing the trees in, in plantations, whether you like it or not. By growing trees in plantations, you're actually sparing the natural forest. Mm -hmm. Today, 7% of the land surface is plantations. Uh, sorry, 7% of the, the wooded areas is plantations. They already provide 50% of the wood we use. Mm. Take the wood from plantations, spare the logging in natural forests, and start building buildings out of this. Um, new forms, there's new, and get the architects on board. Start really thinking big. There are projects, there's projects in New York, Vancouver, where they're looking at building skyscrapers. The sky's the limit, totally. And then I think the other area that where a revolution is also possible is in displacing chemicals, um, pe petroleum-based chemicals. Mm. If you think about the ocean of plastic that's floating around the size of France in the Pacific Ocean, okay, let's start using renewable fibers. Let, let's ban plastic. Let's, let's think big. Let's actually... The, 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 produ the production capacity for fiber is there. And also, where do you produce the fiber? If you're actually, it's a very simple chemical fact that you actually learn at school mm. that carbon dioxide plus water produces sugar and, and oxygen. That's photosynthesis, mm -hmm. and that's the basis of producing fiber. And actually, photosynthesis, which is not rocket science, works best when the, when the sun comes out. So actually, this is, this is a massive opportunity for producing more fiber in, in the sunny parts of the world, in, in, in that subtropical, tropical belt, where yeah. actually the demand is needed. Just think of it, if you could actually produce um, more fiber in a plantation for for farmers in Senegal, and that, that fiber is then used through tissue printing to make their houses. Um, there's the, the social, the, the whole, the implications of this are massive, and, and I think we have to, it's, it's dreams, but they're possible. And I Great. think, you know, this is, this is really exciting times. Great, well, before we turn to some of the challenges of market adoption and, and delivery, I want to pause briefly and see if there's questions on some of the things we've been talking about. I'm sure there okay. are. So we'll take, a, we'll take a round of questions, and then we're gonna turn back to some of the delivery issues and market issues. My name's um, Dominic, I'm a PhD student here at Cambridge. Uh, you talk about 3D um, printing. What role do you think that um, 3D printing of um, meat and uh, like animal protein uh, to play? Because obviously the meat industry in general is um, you know, intensely, like it's water intensive, it's energy intensive, um, and it's taking like primary sources of energy, turning it to secondary and tertiary ones, tertiary ones before people actually consume our food. Sure. So, Good question. Like okay, we'll take one more question and then we'll answer this. Yours. Yeah. This lady. Yeah. Hi, um, lovely talk. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much for um, the amazing talk. Much. Uh, my question is pretty much um, there is a lot of traditional, like, well, bad thoughts about like GMO, like development, and everything. Like, a lot of people thought um, if you come soon, like GMO food and everything will have some bad effects on your and stuff like that. So, I'm just wondering uh, what is your thought on that um, on GMO food productions and um, how do you think um, a scientist who can face this kind of, uh, well, negative? Uh, Impact Thank you. Great question. All right. So, first question, perhaps go ahead, Mike, and, and then we'll turn to anyone who wants to answer <coughs> the second question. I, I think it's um, I, 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 for the tissue printing question. I, I mean, I saw recently an advert from Pirelli where they were promoting an, a new form of tire that you know they had a couple driving across a, 
a warm uh, environment and then they want to go up to the mountain so they stop at a station and there's a new snow tyre printed onto their, their car, ten minutes later they drive off and they're in the mountains. Mm. I think that's very easy to market and people are going to, they're just going to buy that technology or it'll be incorporated into your car automatically. Selling, selling tissue printed hamburgers is, is another question and then it's, it's a very, again it becomes very emotional. Uh, I think I think there was a study done in in San Francisco, or um, you know where you know it does make a lot of sense. You could grow the the basic protein building blocks in bacteria or yeast, uh, and and produce a steak in a lab, um, it, it, which has all the qualities of uh, of a steak. Um, you know, do people want to eat that? I don't know, and and that's 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 a, a very different question. Um, by doing so, you would actually spare all of the, the, the problems of, of, uh, of growing soy or, or corn for, for that, you know, and, and the, the huge ecological footprint of that. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of issues that need to go into it, but it comes down to a consumer taking something off a supermarket shelf and saying, I'm going to eat that tonight. Mm. That's, that's a difficult one. I think mm. use of fibers for buildings, that's a no-brainer, but... For, for eating, it's always such a sensitive issue. And How does the farmer feel about that? <laughs> well, I, look, I, I, think, I think the world has just enormous challenges of how we feed ourselves. And I do, I do think one of the ways around um, the tensions um, will, will be around synthetic um, meat replacements. Um, now, what I don't know is the scale of acceptability, exactly as Mike, Mike said. Um, and that really will have to be played out. I know at the moment I was in California a couple of four weeks ago um, and it's all the talk and the big tech investors are putting money into it um, so I, I do think there, there's obviously mileage in it um, whether it's going to be what replaces the average person's evening meal I'm, I'm not sure um, and you know, what the wealthy will do in, in um, I know Palo Alto is going to be a million miles away from somebody who at the end of their hard week's work has not got a lot of money left and that, that's going to be a real challenge but uh, I think there is potential there because livestock does have a massive imprint on the, on the, on the planet. And yet livestock, carefully managed, can also be part of a system that helps sequester carbon in the soil. Um, you know, if you look at some sustainable uh, agroforestry models of ranching, um, there's the impact reduction. So it's, it, it's going to be an interesting question. I can see you're a lobbyist as well. Look, I've got self-interest. I've, I've built large chicken sheds as well. And, and do I like the intensification of poultry farming? I'm a bit uneasy about it. But why have I done it? Because it gives me, and we're allowed to use this word in the, in the family household, it gives me 2,000 tonnes of chicken shed. And, <laughs> and that is rocket fuel. And as I try and rebalance my whole system, and I've been farming on arable growing crops for a long time, I wanted manure. And the one profitable source of that I could find was going into chickens. I'm now feeding 500 tons of my own wheat to the chickens. I'm using straw to heat the sheds. And I've got solar panels on the roof. So as a system, my carbon footprint on that chickens, and I haven't done a full um, whole cropping year with the solar panels, I want to demonstrate that. And I'll be looking for some smart um, graduates, hopefully, to come and help me demonstrate my carbon footprint of what we're doing. But actually, in seven weeks, we produce 400 tons of, of chicken, um, which is just phenomenal on a, on a quite a small site. Yeah. Um, and we, I think we're doing it in a reasonably sustainable way. How about the GMO question? Uh, well, yes, it, it's a very interesting, the emotional part in it, because no, but, uh, it should be possible to explain uh, a bit of science, but. Uh, for people, it's already too much that uh, uh, gene engineering is absolutely na natural. Uh, there is horizontal gene transfer. It was, uh, one, one example is the sweet potatoes. It's, uh, we could prove that there is already, probably since 6,000 years, the whole tDNA is present in all the uh, sweet potatoes that are used all over the world. We find it that it is there since so long uh, because it gives some hormones and they have a higher yield and when people started agriculture, uh, they did it. Uh, there is 
slowly one sees that uh, some transfer uh, from genes be between bacteria and aphids have happened. It's also a horizontal gene transfer. In nature, that goes. The whole evolution of microorganisms uh, for billions of years and all, the, all today is horizontal gene transfer. So th there is nothing magic in the genetic engineering and no, not the slightest a uh, sign of danger has ever been seen. And still, people are disgusted by this idea. But people are so much disgusted by ideas. Uh, people are disgusted for homosexuals. People are disgusted <laughs> for that. Uh, start to analyze the racism, how people have used concepts of pure genetics that you have to have. And the others, is, he is inferior. It is shown. And famous people sometimes have taken on uh, uh, arguments on, uh, on that. And, 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 and that's the, the, what we have to realize and to communicate um, among young people that, that, that uh, what is really science and what is ideology that goes mm -hmm. around. Yeah. Chinese government knows it very well. They do massive progress in, uh, in the GMO world, but they never say that they were doing GMO. Uh, and uh, the, the, the GMOs are used uh, because, but not systematically. And uh, they always say, well, we, uh, we will look into that. We will look into that. So a lot of benefit from GMOs for and, uh, the farmers, but perhaps some of that has not been understood uh, by the consumer side. And so perhaps the next generation of GMOs could be more consumer targeted for nutrition or quality of food or shelf life. Uh, you were going to make a comment. Uh, I was, and I, was, I, was, I don't know if this is going to be broadcast. I'll get myself shot probably or um, my, my flattering title taken off me. I was invited once to have, have lunch with the, with the Queen and she leant over and she said, um, so is Charles right about GM? And I thought, Christ, how, how the hell do you answer a question like that? <laughs> <laughs> the speech bubble would be unpredictable. You know, I wouldn't be able to print, uh, print it. And, um, I said, I can understand why people are worried about taking a fish gene and putting it into strawberries. But actually taking a, what we're doing in John Innes, just out 50 miles up the road from here, they're taking um, they took wild genes out of wild potatoes and putting them into new breeds of potatoes. So they're now blight resistance. Now the source of the Irish famine mm. was because of blight. Now, instead of farmers having to spray 20 times a year, which we can do in a really wet, horrible year, you could get a wild gene from a wild potato and put it into modern high-yielding varieties and you're not having to spray. That's just smart plant breeding, isn't it? Mm. But we've allowed the big companies like Monsanto, etc., to take over the debate, which I think was a mistake. Now we need, what we need critically is we need, we need consumers to trust independent bodies. Now, whether that can be government, whether it has to be set up in a, in a new structure, but we need to have bodies that consumers can trust. And mm. I think, Margaret, you're absolutely right. We've got to move on than it just being about me not having to spray, but actually be building stronger bones, mm. helping people have healthier lives and building that into it. Because it is just smart plant breeding. Great. Let's have uh, two to three more questions, OK? I'll try. Uh, I'm Raphael from Bayer Crop Science, and I just had to ask. Um, so I was in this conference last year, and this guy that worked in this huge biotech company states that they kind of blame themselves because when we had the biotech crops in the market, we didn't prepare the consumer for it. And now we have this revolution and crispr cars is, is starting. And my question is, as leaders, how can we better prepare our communities to receive this new technology in the market? Great question. OK. Um, who was the second? Yes. Uh, just to read it thank you so much. I have two questions. Do we have enough emphasis in our school and college textbooks on the importance of farmers in contrast to science or engineers? And the second question is, how do we engage farmers in biotech by educating them, as the previous speaker said, if this is new technologies. Given that we don't have one farmer in GAP summit, and we are discussing how we should develop agriculture technology for the farmers. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Nellie, an undergrad here at the University of Cambridge. 
I'll just give a very good context to my question and then also question. But so I'm from Russia, and now there's a very disturbing trend of Lysenkoism. A regime of plurality, uh, just uh, Lysenko was uh, uh, the main agronomist in the Stalinist period, and because he didn't believe in genes, he believed the environment influenced uh, uh, the inheritance, he caused great famines. So, how can we, what can we do now uh, to actually influence the decisions or that other governments make and move in the directions that agriculture goes so that we ensure that all the countries find a consensus and come together to uh, avert the food crisis? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Amadeus Excited by Technology in Indonesia, and I'm doing a PhD in food science in the US. So I'll thank you very much for making the time for this very interesting panel. I would like to address um, what Professor Montagu brought forward. It's about forestry and biotech. And it was also brought forward by Dr. May. But I would like to confirm, is it? Forestry was linked with fiber production and then later 3D printing. So um, maybe many questions about agriculture and biotech, but what about forestry and biotech? Where are we now in terms of government regulations, industry and academia? Okay, so, thank, thank you. you. Why don't we start with the forestry question? No? And then I think that some of the questions have a lot to do with acceptance and market access and regulatory issues, so we'll, we'll take those questions after that, so. <clears throat> I, I can answer that question very quickly. Um, in, in the last few years, there's been um, a lot of progress in applying biotechnology to forestry issues. Um, the issues in forestry are very similar to those in agriculture. You need to produce more with less, so there's a big focus on yield. Um, and there's also obviously a big focus on, on disease resistance. Mm -hmm. um, you only have to look outside. You've got Dutch elm disease, you've got diseases affecting the horse chestnuts, you've got oak galls, you've got ash dieback. It, it's, it's a global problem. Um, so, so biotechnology is being applied to all of these. I would just give one example that you might find of interest in, on, on this disease front. Uh, I mean, our, our focus is on eucalyptus in Brazil. Um, it's very much a commercially oriented uh, program. Um, mm. In the US, though, there's been a very interesting program to uh, study um, the, uh, the American, uh, and now is it? Elm. The American elm, Dutch thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and they've, they've, the American elm, uh, and also there's a, the American chestnut. chestnut, thank you, that old chestnut. Um, and and there's, there's a huge problem that the, there was, there used to be a, along the, the East Coast, there used to be a, 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 you know, they used to say a squirrel could go from north to south without mm -hmm. ever leaving a chestnut tree. Well, you, you, that no longer exists and they're trying to bring the chestnut tree back and to do that they have to overcome this, this fungal disease. So there's, there's been a biotech application there purely for a, a landscape res restoration approach that wouldn't have been possible by there's no genes available in the natural germplasm, so they brought this resistance gene in, I think, from a, from a Chinese chestnut. So there's, there's one example of, of biotechnology being used for a, for a, for a, for a biodiversity issue. Um, so there's many, many applications of, of biotechnology for forestry, both commercial uh, and non-commercial. Um, and the, the crop base, if you like, it's not just about eucalyptus, there's, there's many species around the world uh, are being studied for this, so um, yes, it's a long way behind field crops, but uh, it's certainly there and it's certainly going to be applied. Regulations are uh, very much the same as they are for field crops, so for example, where we operate in Brazil, uh, the regulations are in place and um, we were the first company to actually introduce a new genetically engineered eucalyptus in Brazil. So um, there's progress, I know. Could we, could we finish those? I think the other questions are really key on regulatory. So just a quick answer. There's a, there's a very, very quickly, time. I'll tie the two together about um, schools and, and education. Um, actually, what we've done as farming as a, as a worldwide is we've painted this as not being a great industry. It is about subsistence. It is about not earning enough. It's about working long hours. We need to make farming to be seen as an exciting, innovative career. 
it's central to the big global challenges. Why do I want my kids to get involved? It's going to be high tech. It's going to be making a difference. It's addressing big challenges. It's got to be seen as a great career choice, whether you're actually a high tech practitioner on farm or doing these jobs that uh, the job speakers are doing in, in their world. This industry is going to make a difference. That's how we've got to do more work in schools, in adopting technology and winning hearts and minds. Yeah, and I would just say on the regulatory side, um, a lot of innovation uh, is being advanced. Uh, different, different countries have a strength in this. US, Canada, uh, the Netherlands, there's a lot of innovation happening and we are going to be pushing those boundaries. But to catch up regulators to where the science is, is perhaps the biggest gap we have. So I'll end with that. But if any of you wish to speak to any of us after this at the break, we'd be glad to talk with you more. Thank you for your time. <laughs>